Welcome to the Get Stoked Podcast with Paul Stokes. Life lessons learned on the water that you can apply to everyday life. Now, here's Paul. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the Get Stoked Podcast. Really excited about today's episode. Um, having a guy come in that uh, I've known since the 80s, really. Uh, competed at Barefoot Nationals way back in the day. He was uh, immediately following me at Cypress Gardens. Um, ended up competing with him at the X Games, which was kind of the glory days of barefoot water skiing. And we're going to talk about that. What a great experience. But we have a guy that is such a well-rounded athlete, um, uh, really one of the most amazing skiers out there as far as getting it all done. Um, everything you've ever seen off a ski jump from a freestyle perspective um, can do everything on bare footing, long distance jumping. Um, one of the best show skiers um, really ever. Is that fair to say? So we have uh, uh, Matt May. Thanks for joining <laughs> us today, Matt. Oh, great to be here, Paul. I'm uh, down in Australia, so I'm a little bit ahead of you on the time scale today, but uh, happy to join you and, and great to be a part of it. Yeah, so it's Monday morning there, and uh, here in Wisconsin, it's Sunday night. So uh, anyway, thanks for carving out the time. And uh, what I, Matt and I spoke about was some of the stories. He's got such a long history in the sport, and he's got so many lessons to share. You know, on this podcast, we really try to share experiences we've had on the water and tie it back to life lessons. And so we've talked about a few that uh, we thought we'd talk about. And the first one that I'd like to go into is um, your unbelievably cool and famous and amazing uncle, Skip Gilkerson, and some of the life lessons and experiences you had with Skip. So let's talk a little bit about Skip. So Skip, so he likes to, his claim to fame is that uh, he's the most interesting person he ever met. Um, he was voted the greatest show skier of all time in the early 90s when the Water Ski Magazine came out with um, the greatest people in each of their disciplines. Uh, Skip was a real true pri pioneer. Um, he was a great skier, most of all a great showman. Um, but from what I gained from him was his positive energy, uh, his zest for life. He lived each day with enthusiasm and he was a very inspiring coach. So all along the way, uh, probably from age two to all the way until I was 20, he coached me along the way, uh, whether he knew that discipline of the sport or not. He was such a positive influence on me that he, he'd make you believe you could do anything. So there's some big points in my career, whether it be barefoot nationals, uh, competing at Marine World Freestyle when I was 15, um, I was a collegiate All-American at Rollins, uh, so he was there for all the, all the big moments for me, and I always knew that if he was in my corner, that I had a, I had a chance to succeed. So, yeah, huge influence, um, you know, not only in skiing, but as I've gotten older in life uh, to what I try to do on a daily basis and how I try to raise my kids, too. That's amazing. He, he was such a personality. Um... Like you say, as strong as a skier he was, his his showmanship and his spirit just elevated everything around him. Yeah, and he, he always had made time for people, no matter who you were. He uh, worked for Mastercraft Boats. He ran the Pro Tour. So the, early, the reason he left show skiing, Tommy Bartlett's, in 1983 was to start the Pro Tour in 1984, which uh, Rob Shirley hired Skip directly to manage the pro tour um, and you can see what blossomed from that you know not just uh, freestyle jumping uh, but certainly the big names of the sport at the time Carl Roberge and Sammy Duvall and Camille Duvall so you know I was involved with that early era of um, the pro tour and I think I was doing exhibitions on the pro tour from around maybe 1986 somewhere in there so Wow. Got to travel around the world doing barefoot exhibitions uh, as a 10-year-old around there. And, uh, and then I used to I'd do a heli and a flip off the ramp as well when I could do that. So uh, a lot of great experiences growing up uh, with Mastercraft, Skip, and the Pro Tour. 
man, those memories of the pro tour, and those, those glory days, I, I miss them. And you, I know you've put some compilations together of some of those days of the freestyle pro tour. And uh, just let, just know we'll, we'll share links to a lot of this great footage. Um, such amazing stuff. So one of the stories you mentioned um, and one of my great memories of you was the X games and uh, having you come in and compete. Um, there were 16 competitors. There was a couple slots and um, uh, Skip called you and Dave Reinhardt to come in and you guys really hustled and you know, you guys, guys were both, I know Reinhardt was a champion barefoot jumper when he was a men's overall champion at one time. Um, and you barefoot jumped, but neither one of you barefoot jumping wasn't your expertise. So tell me a little bit about that experience and how Skip lifted you up and motivated you and how you stayed disciplined on uh, getting through and doing the X Games on Mission Bay in San Diego. Yeah, so I had graduated college, uh, didn't have a job for a few months. I uh, was, was going to be off to Australia, ironically. Must have been the fall of 97. And uh, Dave and I were working on some wakeboarding, and he was pretty good on a wakeboard already. And I was learning Rayleigh's. And, you know, Rayleigh's on a wakeboard at that time were somewhat comparable to the inverted style of jumping. Sure. So once I got Rayleigh's down both ways wakeboarding, we thought, you know, let's start let's try to invert barefoot jump. And it was for no real reason. It wasn't to go on a competition. It was, Hey, we've got some time. Uh, freestyle jumping was sort of dead and off the tour. So we thought let's, let's challenge ourselves for something else. So we're down in Delray beach, uh, skied with the guy who you, I'm sure you'd know named Mike Frankenbush. Oh yeah. And, uh, and Mike, um, it was pretty funny because Mike himself was, was trying to, break on the scene, I think, for his age group and that. And within about the first two lessons he gave us, Dave and I were out out jumping him. Um, so it was it was a fun experience. And that was probably, I'm guessing, November, something like that. Um, comes around to June and Mastercraft was the main sponsor of the X Games. So with um, wakeboarding and barefooting. Uh, and like you said, I had a couple guys pull out of the events. They initially asked Zane to to do it because uh, he was competing in wakeboarding and probably a top three guy at, at that time. But uh, he pulled he out. He didn't and, jump inverted, I don't think. No, I don't think he jumped inverted, but I, they thought, oh, Zane's here anyway. Do you want to fill the, fill the bracket? So anyway, he backed out. And Skip, uh, I was still sponsored by MasterCraft at that time. So Skip said, oh, look, I'll get Dave Reinhardt and Matt to come out, and, you know, they'll they'll fill the spot. And they've been training all winter. and. You know, they're jumping big. I'm sure Skip was telling stories about how, how good we were. But in reality, we probably only landed 15, 20 inverted jumps. Wow. I mean, I think it probably got to a point where it was like we weren't planning to compete. So, you know, we both jumped whatever it was at that time, maybe 70 feet, 75 feet. I don't know what the barrier was. Uh, but I was skiing down at SeaWorld in Texas and basically got a call on a Thursday night to fly out the next day um so no practice whatsoever not even you know not even on the on the charts to uh have that opportunity so yeah um first off the dock obviously last seat or you know um the least experience and first jump uh didn't even do any tricks at all didn't even do a one foot didn't even do a tumble turn so uh with the x games format you obviously got points for points all the for tricks. That. yeah yeah, but my only concern was just make a jump. Just don't embarrass yourself. Go out there and make a jump. I think. And, uh, you landed one right now. First, first jump off the dock, it was around 80 feet and ended up holding up fourth for the day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I qualified fourth out of 16 people on, on the first day. So, it was, and, you know, Skip's on the dock and he's telling everybody that, you know, how good we are and he's just. I don't even know. <laughs> he, he, he believed we were. So we believed we were good enough. And, and actually, Reinhardt did quite well, too. He, he landed a couple big jumps, but didn't make the top eight. He might have ended up around 10th. And, and uh, I know that you made the, the – I, I made the cut. I made the cut. I ended up seventh at the end of the day. I don't remember after day one, but 
yeah, so pretty cool little whirlwind, you know? And uh, I remember Lane Bowers, you'll probably be mad at me for saying this, but uh, he was quite upset that two show skiers came in and showed up some guys that uh, barefooted and we didn't have the clincher gloves and we didn't wear a cup and didn't have the equipment. But, uh, you know, it kind of teaches you that, you know, like, like they say in sports, it's, uh, it's not about who the best on the water is. It's, it's who the best on the day is. And it takes you one question. One time in life to make that, uh, you know, make an impression, um, whether it be competing or whether it be, you know, work or whether it be in, being a dad. Um, but, you know, you got to believe in yourself. And, and for me, it's kind of this one thing that stood out for me 20 years later that on that day, on that time with that group of people, with Ron Scarpa, Peter Fleck, uh, Momo Colosio, um, you know, can't think of all the names that yeah. were there. but Brett Sands. But, you know, if, if, if we did that 20 times, would I make the finals 20 times? No, absolutely not. So, uh, yeah, skip, I guess, my corner, you just believe in yourself. A lot of fun. It's a cool event. Well, uh, our video lagged a little bit, but I wanted to say a couple of things while the video catches up. Um, a little shout out to Mike Frankenbush. You mentioned Mike. He, uh, he actually just got a record deal. His band, Mind of Fury, just landed a record deal, which is totally cool. Um, I bought their latest album, and I'm looking forward to what they get put out by a, a record label. But Frankenbush is still living down there on those canals getting it done, so I appreciate you mixing him in. So, um, but what a cool story. It was truly amazing you guys came out of nowhere and, and did so well in that competition. And it, it made an impression on me too. And, and like you mentioned, the, the lesson there was really, t you know, having an opportunity, seizing on it, and just giving it your best that day. And, and it turned out well, and you got a little paycheck that day too, right? So that was good. Yeah, I did. So that was actually the, the qualifying, and then I, I did – pretty well in the semifinals as well. I think I ended up six, but a couple, probably two feet out of the, the final. But uh, yeah, what an experience. The X Games in San Diego was uh, not the best conditions oh. for wakeboarding or barefooting, but just an amazing event for water skiing. Yeah, I remember the yeah, salt water cool. in the eyes is what I remember. <laughs> so uh, another thing we talked about that I thought was great, I, I skied at Cypress Gardens in 91 and a little bit of 92, and then you came in right at that same time, about the time I was actually heading out. And you have great memories of that as I do. I was 18 years old coming in there. And I was intimidated by all this greatness. I mean, you walk through the doorway and it's, you know, home of the world's greatest water skiers. And there's all these, you know, guys I used to watch on TV. You know, there's Dave Dotter and um, Scotty Clack and um, the Voissards. Um, there's just, it's just loaded with all these, this talent. Uh, Punky Forgiana, o Otis Wilson were these barefooters that I really looked up to. And um, it really humbled me. And here you were, I was 18 and it was like, wow, you were 15 years old walking in the door there and, uh, and an amazing skier already. But then you walk in there. So let's talk about your experience at Cypress Gardens. Well, you look back and if you, if you ever had a chance to go to the gardens in the late eighties or early nineties, mid nineties, and there was such a mystique about the place. I mean, it was the, the Notre Dame of, you know, water skiing. Yeah. You're going to ski anywhere. If you're going to play football in some big stadium, where are you going to play? Um, and, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty surreal for me. I was quite young at 15. Um, Mark Boisard took me under his wing. Um, I remember playing uh, touch football in the morning for oh, our yeah. training. Yeah. Um, he made me practice doubles straight away. I think I was about the same size as, as some of the girls. I was um, pretty, pretty small at that time, but uh, found the smallest girl and made me learn doubles straight away. Was that I know Kathy? 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 Yeah. Kathy Lister at the time. But, uh, you know, he didn't, didn't make any favoritism. Um, but it was, like, it's, it was like a fraternity at the time. Quite intimidating. Uh, you certainly had to prove yourself there, um, not just as a skier, but you had to go through 
the some initiations or some hard knocks, if you will, I guess. Uh, I remember my first jump back there, Mark Boisert said, I know you're going to be fine, but, you know, just be careful. Just look out, you know, look out for yourself. And after the four man flip, it was the tradition that somebody would pull up on the rope and take you out. So you'd have to, you didn't get the glory of skiing back to the dock. To the dock. Yeah, you weren't going to salute at the dock. <laughs> you yeah, were swimming in. <laughs> That's right. You don't get that payoff your first jump set. So, uh, you know, it was certainly something I look back on and think, you know, is there a value in an initiation? No, maybe not. But at the time, it was like, I, I respected it, and for what it was worth, whether it was, you know, guys like Dave Dodder or Scotty Clack, uh, Ty Ingeseth, there was a guy in there there named Al Baker, and uh, he was like the, he was like the enforcer in, in uh, ice hockey. He was just kind of a, you won't guy. He's big. Great uh, experience for me down there. Guy lifting weights was Big Ben. Um, you know, maybe it still is now, but uh, at the gardens, that's everybody. You know, lifted between shows, and because it was a year-round job, and and uh, you know they had a a lot to do. So uh, it was a great great point in my life. Um, learned mobs down there that that uh, winter from Scotty Clack, and then started competing on the pro tour shortly after that. So yeah, I learned learned mobs at 15 in that season, and then kind of took off on challenging on the pro tour from there. Yeah, that's amazing. So I know someone that you spent a lot of time with. You mentioned them training for the X Games. Um, someone you have a high regard for and taught you a lot uh, was Dave Reinhardt. And um, that's a guy that I, I was never around a whole lot. In fact, maybe it was only at the X Games that I did uh, get to hang out with him. But I always looked up to him. He is a, an incredible talent. I remember there was something – was it his eye? He was blind in one eye or something with one eye? Yeah, that's right. He got, he got into a construction accident probably ooh, late 80s. He would, would have been, I don't know, early 20s and got a nail stuck in his eye. Oh so basically, he, he could see light and movement but not really distinguish anything. So he basically only had vision out of one eye, which made him not have really any depth perception. So Reinhardt was never famous for his clean landings, but uh, always did the difficult tricks. Uh, yeah, but I remember the I remember front mob. It was the ugliest thing, the front mob. Remember, wasn't he the innovator of that? He was the innovator. And uh, at the time, it was either a lot of guys trying double fronts, and he thought that trick's never going to be consistent. So he um, went with the front mob and you know, basically made his, his fortune, uh, if you will, if there is one in, in yeah. water sports. Right. Uh, off that trick but um, ultimate humble guy uh, I remember meeting him on the tour when I was doing exhibitions and I barely even know who he was he wouldn't even really tell you his name was you wouldn't know if he was the guy at the concession stand or you know this pro athlete uh, super humble um, but the ultimate competitor uh, when it came time down you know down to crunch time uh, but yeah certainly learned a lot of humility from him uh, um, learned how to charge from him, uh, learned how to train smart as well. Uh, we, you know, we went out there and learned a lot of the basics. We'd go out on one ski and we would just do a couple days on one ski jumpers trying to see how far we could go. We'd, we'd go 120 feet, you know, full out double weight cut just on a ride over. And at the time, you know, everybody thought, oh, nobody wants to learn a ride over. Gainers are easier, flips are easier. And Technically, they are, but when you want to get distance on these tricks, you got to put in the time. So, you know, that's one of the things I've noticed over the last, the, the next generation, when freestyle hasn't become a distance event, that, that the guys lose track of uh, their ability to go far or, or higher off the ramp and then drop boat speed. So, anyway, yeah, I learned a lot from Reinhardt uh, and barefooting as well. Um, spent a lot of time at his house down in Delray and just a, an awesome guy, and we still keep in touch. So, big influence on me too. Amazing. So coming up, we've talked about how you've kind of been off the water. You're married now, have some kids, um, been doing some other things career wise, but you're excited because you're going to have the opportunity to ski. It sounds like with team Australia at the next show worlds. Um, hopefully that's not a secret, but, uh, you're going to be getting out on the water even later this afternoon and uh, getting some freestyle in. So tell us about 
you know, how excited you are about that, and how some of your lessons, like you said, training smart, you're not going to go out there and try a MOB on your, this afternoon, right? So um, just tell us about how you're looking forward to that and what your strategy is and what you hope to accomplish. Yeah, so the Australian team has competed now in, I believe, four worlds, and they've just got increasingly better each time. Uh, actually, at the latest one in Canada, on day two, they actually beat the U.S. on score. I didn't know that. Um, so, so they've really taken on the show aspect of it and really focus on production and their flow and their comedy uh, because it's very difficult to keep up with the U.S. guys. You know, they've got 15 guys on the team. Five guys do mobs. Everybody does a one ski trick. Um, you know, guys like Dan Olson doing back landing stuff off the ramps. So, a little mile. So, um, name and that uh, evolved a little bit with Australian ski last week. And now that it's coming on to Australian home court, I feel it's kind of a bucket list for me to, you know, be on a team. Um, and, and, uh, I can do it and support them as well. Like I don't have to be the skier I was 20 years ago, um, but certainly um, flips and gainers and one skis. And we'll see if, uh, if I start doing any mobs. Uh, I don't have any worry that I can do it, but do I really want to take that one crash? Probably not. Uh, but yeah, anyway, show ski nationals happening next week in Perth. So flying over for that. And, uh, and then hopefully I'll be selected for the team and be competing against the U S uh, in the other five countries uh, in March of 2020. So are you doing the individual jumping act? Like how, how do you, how are you trying out for the team next week or in a couple weeks? Um, a little bit based on resume. Um, and certainly this will be the first time I've ever officially competed in an Australian event or been on an Australian team. So I have been down and skied with a lot of these guys over the last 10 years. Um, but, yeah, I've put in my application like anyone else. Um, and I do think I can help the team. We don't have the depth here in Australia that the Americans have. Um, so it, it'll be fun, and I, and I want to do it to be part of that teamwork and that camaraderie and, and uh, just how well everyone can work together to put together a show. You know, that's the thing about show skiing, that the entertainment value, I value a lot. Like, for me, the – the show just being entertaining. Like my, one of my favorite shows was the Hatfield and McCoys um, back at SeaWorld way back. And it wasn't, it had nothing to do with the talent or the, how good the scheme was at that show. It was just how funny and fun the show was and gold rush too. Some of those shows are just so fun to watch beyond just the skiing. And that's what I think Australia, you know, tries to bring to the table is just something really fun. And Peter O'Neill is such a great guy. So I do, he's probably the Australian as far as on the show team that I know the best. And he'll certainly have a good time hanging out with that guy. <laughs> yeah, he brings a lot to the team. They are so dedicated down there um, in Moela to getting themes and getting the right flow and what's something quirky we can do. Uh, they had a great script. Uh, I know in 2016, the one stands out. Um, but uh, 2018 was was very good as well. So hopefully we can mix it together and and give the USA a little run for their money. Um, it'd be it'd be fun to get a victory for Australia. Not that I have anything against the US, but it's you know look it's uh, nice to even even the playing field. Um, hopefully it'll be a great event. Have you caught up at all? We'll mention one guy real quick. Have you caught up with Oscar Footman at all over there? You know, it's funny you mentioned his name. I think he probably only lives about 20 minutes from me. Okay. We're friends on Facebook, the, the foot. And I remember being involved in barefooting in the late 80s and him being around. Yeah. Um, and actually, his sister-in-law works at my work. And we talk about him every now and then. But I've never – I haven't seen him. I, well, I, last time I, saw him, I know, I should. I know. We both know that, that we have a – a mutual connection at work. Um, I saw him down at Moela maybe 10 years ago at a, a barefoot event or it was a, an expo event. Okay. And that, yeah, that's the last, last we saw of each other. Well, he's the only other uh, U.S. buddy that I know that moved over there pretty much permanently. So uh, that's why I mention it. But uh, man, so great to catch up with you. Um, 
you've had an amazing water ski career. You're such a great talent. And now I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, well, hopefully you got to make that team first. So you better make that team here. Right. <laughs> got to make the team. Got to be able to get out of bed in the morning after I practice too. Yeah. Yeah. So have a great practice today. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And uh, there's no doubt we'll see you down the road at, at some event. All right. Thanks for having me, Paul. Appreciate right. it. So, yeah. Thanks for listening to the Get Stoked podcast with Paul Stokes. You can contact Paul at ontheballpaul.com. We look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, stay stoked. <laughs>